Section 2.8 covers one-to-one -one and inverse functions. So first, let's talk about the concept of a function being one-to-one. -one. So the definition of a one-to-one -one function is that a function is called one-to-one -one if no two elements of the domain have the same element in the range. In other words, if f of x1 is not the same as f of x2, so if two y values are different, then the x values where they come from must also be different. So we have an illustration up above. A one-to-one -one function is where one x value gets assigned exactly one y value, and every y value only comes from exactly one x value. So this first example here is a one-to-one -one function. This one is not. Here you can see that both of the elements, 3 and 2, both go to the same y value of 4. So two different x values, if they go to the same y value, it can still be a function, but it's not a 1 to 1 function. So 1 to 1 means that 1x gets assigned to 1y, and 1y comes from exactly 1x value. Graphically speaking, you can see that a function is not one-to-one -one if two different x values have the same y value. And if they have the same y value, that means if you draw a horizontal line at that point, or at those two points, you will hit the graph more than once. So for a, for a function to be one-to-one, -one, a horizontal line that you draw can only hit the graph one time. So just like the vertical line test, we have a horizontal line test. And we say that that function is one-to-one -one if and only if no horizontal line intersects its graph more than once. Now to further illustrate this, let's take a look at two functions. Let's look at the function f of x equals x squared and g of x equals x cubed. We can see very clearly that the function x squared is not a one-to-one -one function. Because if you draw a horizontal line just about anywhere, you can see that it's going to intersect the graph more than once. So for example, if, if you draw a horizontal line at y equals four, there will be an x value associated with that down here, which will be positive two, and there will be another one associated with down here, which would be like negative two. And so we have f of 2 is equal to 4, and f of negative 2 is also equal to 4. So we have two different x values going to the same y value. So x squared is not 1 to 1. The function g of x equals x cubed is a 1 to 1 function. Once again, it's really clear that any horizontal line that you draw is only going to intersect this function one time. And you can see this quite easily. Any horizontal line that we draw is only hitting the graph one time. So it, it satisfies this horizontal line test. So this function is one-to-one. -one. And by the way, the abbreviation for saying that a function is one-to-one -one is simply writing one dash one. So this function is not one-to-one, -one, and this function is one to one. Now one other concept that I want to cover is that you can take a function that is not one to one and you can sometimes make it one to one. So let's go back to our function f of x equals x squared. What I can do is I can impose a restriction on the domain here. So I'm basically saying that we're going to look at the function x squared but we're only going to concern ourselves with non-negative values of x. So we're only allowed to plug in values of x that are greater than or equal to zero. Now, if you graph this function, what you're gonna get is only the right-hand side of that parabola. And now it's really clear that any horizontal line that you draw is now only intersecting the graph one time. So each of those has exactly one x value associated with it. And now the function is one-to-one. -one. So when you have a function that is not one-to-one, -one, you can sometimes make it one-to-one -one by restricting its domain. This is actually a pretty common thing that is done in trigonometry. When you define the inverse trigonometric functions,
you need to restrict the domain of your trig functions so that you have a one-to-one -one function. More about that later, though. Now let's define what it means to be an inverse of a function. So if we assume that a function f is one-to-one -one with a domain a and a range b, then its inverse function, which we call f inverse, has domain b and range a, and it is defined by the inverse function of y is equal to x any time that f of x is equal to y for any value of y in the set b. Okay, so that can be a little bit confusing. Let's look at this diagram here. This diagram is a much easier way to understand the concept of an inverse function. So we know that when you have a function f, its job is to take a number x from the set A, the domain, and it's going to transform it into a new number, which we call f of x, and we say that that number belongs to the set B. What the inverse function does is it starts at this value y in set B, and it gives you a rule or a function that takes that value y back to the x value where it started from in set A. So that's what we mean when we say the inverse function evaluated at y is equal to x. That's what's meant by that right here. So this inverse function is just a rule that is going to take the y value back to where it came from in the original function. So here we have an example. Let's suppose we have some function f. And we know that f of 1 is equal to 5, f of 3 is equal to 7, and f of 8 is equal to negative 10. And I'm drawing a picture of that here. f of 1 equals 5, f of 3 equals 7, f of 8 is equal to negative 10. And using this information, we would like to find the inverse function of f at 5, the inverse function of f at 7, and the inverse function of f at negative 10. And all it's going to do, if you notice, it's going to take those numbers 5, 7, and negative 10, which are these numbers here, and it's going to send them back to where they came from. And that's what you see in the second diagram. So the inverse function of 5 is equal to 1. And that's because f of 1 was 5, right? The inverse function of 7 is equal to 3. And that's because f of 3 was equal to 7. And finally, the inverse function at negative 10 is equal to 8. And again, that was because f of 8 is equal to negative 10. So the inverse function simply reverses the process of whatever it was that the function did. So to help us illustrate this, let's go ahead and consider the function f of x is equal to 3x plus 4. And I've made a small table of values here. When x is 1, y is 7. When x is 0, y is 4. And when x is negative 4, y is negative 8. What I'd like to do is illustrate the inverse function that would reverse all of these values. And we'll talk about how to find inverse functions in just a minute. But for this one, I'm just going to tell you the inverse function here would end up being x minus 4 divided by 3. And to understand that this actually is the inverse, let's go ahead and take the y values that we got over here, and we're going to represent those as x values in our inverse function. And what should happen, if this is actually the inverse function, is these values should get transformed back into where they came from. So let's just illustrate the point here. If I plug in the number x equals 7 into our inverse function, we would have the inverse function evaluated at 7 is equal to 7 minus 4 divided by 3. And if you do the math on this, this is 3 divided by 3, which is equal to 1. And we'll do the same thing for x equals 4. The inverse function at 4 is equal to 4 minus 4 divided by 3 which is equal to 0 divided by 3, which is 0. And finally, the inverse function evaluated at negative 8 is negative 8 minus 4 divided by 3, 
which is negative 12 divided by 3, which is negative 4. And so we can see just by inspection that all the values that we got here, which were y values, when you take those y values and you plug them into this so-called inverse function, you can see that we are getting back the values that we started with over here. Now, we'll talk about how you find these inverse functions in just a minute. Before we talk about how to find an inverse function, let's look at the inverse function property. So if you have a one-to-one -one function f and it has some domain a and range b, the inverse function f inverse satisfies the following cancellation properties. f inverse of f of x should be equal to x for every value x in the domain, and f of f inverse of x should be equal to x for every x value in the range. So if you have two functions that are inverses, they can only be inverses if they satisfy this property. So anytime two functions are inverses, this will always be true. And conversely, if this is true, then two functions must be inverses. So let's take a look at the functions that we had in the previous example. So we had f of x equals 3x plus 4, and f inverse of x equals x minus 4 over 3. And we kind of saw how these were inverse functions by simply inspecting values, right? We plugged in 3x values, we got 3y values, and then we took those y values and plugged them in as x values, and we, we saw that we got the original values back. That doesn't prove that they're inverse functions. That was just an illustration of how inverse functions work. To prove that these are inverse functions, what we need to do is we need to actually do these compositions. So what we have to do is we have to look at the inverse function composed with the original function. And that means simply we are plugging the original function into the inverse function. So that means we are taking the inverse function, in this case, of 3x plus 4. And when you do that, you are going to plug 3x plus 4 into here. And so that gives us 3x plus 4 minus 4 all divided by 3. And you can see that the plus 4 and minus 4 cancel each other out. So we end up getting 3x divided by 3, and this is equal to x. And that's what we were looking for, right? Because that's what it says here. It should be equal to x. And then we also need to look at the composition the other way. So we have to do f of f inverse of x, which means we are doing the opposite. We are now plugging the inverse function into the original function. So in this case, it means we are plugging x minus 4 over 3 into our function f. And when we do that, we get 3 times x minus 4 over 3 plus 4. And these 3s cancel out. And this gives us x minus 4 plus 4. And this is equal to x, which is the other requirement. And so because both compositions, so if I take the composition in either order, since I'm getting x for both of those, that proves that these two functions that we started with here were actually inverse functions of each other. And this might be a good time to just mention one small detail here that sometimes students will get confused. So f inverse of x, the way we usually say that is the way I just said it, f inverse of x, this denotes the inverse function. Okay, so when you see this, you need to really try to understand that it's not the same as this, okay? So this negative 1 right here does not denote an exponent. It does not mean to take the reciprocal of your function. It's the symbol that we use to indicate that we're talking about the inverse of a function. So you want to be careful not to ever make this mistake. Okay, so this is just a symbol that we use to indicate inverse. This negative 1 doesn't actually have any numerical value in relation to the function itself. The next thing we want to look at is how to find the inverse of a one-to-one -one function. 
So there are three steps, essentially. First, you want to write your function as y equals the function. And then the second and third steps, which can actually be done in either order, is you're going to solve the equation for x in terms of y, and then you're going to interchange x and y. So let me give you a quick example. And we'll do a simple one here. We'll start off with the example of f of x is equal to 3x plus 4, which is the uh, function that we used in the previous two examples. So the first thing I'm going to do if I'm looking for the inverse of this function is I'm going to write it as y equals instead of f of x equals. Then I'm going to take that equation and I'm going to solve for x. So to solve for x here, I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides. This gives us y minus 4 is equal to 3x. And then finally, I'm going to divide by 3 on both sides. And this gives us x equals y minus 4 divided by 3. And then our third step is now you interchange x and y. So you switch x and y. So x becomes y, y becomes x. And this gives us y equals x minus 4 divided by 3. And this is our inverse function. And so because it's our inverse function, we're now going to rename this f inverse of x is equal to x minus 4 divided by 3. So this is the process that you go through to find the inverse of a function. Let's try another example of that. Suppose we have the function g of x is equal to x cubed plus 9. And what I want to do is find the inverse. So find g inverse of x. So first thing I'm going to do is we're going to rename g of x as the variable y. Then we're going to solve for x. So I'm going to subtract 9 from both sides. And then you can see that once we subtract 9 from both sides, we have to solve for x here. We have x cubed. The way you get rid of the cube is you take a cube root of both sides. And this is going to give us the cube root of y minus 9 is equal to x. And then our final step is we're going to switch x and y. Uh, before I do that, though, I like to write it x equals. And then now when I switch x and y, we're going to get y equals the cube root of x minus 9. And basically, this is our inverse function. But now I'm going to use the inverse function notation, which in this case is g inverse of x equals the cube root of x minus 9. Okay, so for our next example, it's a little bit more complicated. We have the function h of x is equal to the negative square root of x plus 3. Now, this function has a naturally restricted domain. We can only plug in values of x that are greater than or equal to negative 3. So I just want you to notice, for example, you cannot plug in a number like x equals negative 4 because that will give you the square root of a negative. So this is not a restriction that we are imposing. This is a restriction that we get from the fact that we have a square root here. Now, I also want to talk about the y values that you get from this. So if you plug in values of x that are greater than or equal to negative 3, these numbers inside are going to be greater than or equal to 0. And when you take the square root of a non-negative number, you get a non-negative number. However, there is a negative on the outside of this. That's going to make the answer negative. So you are only going to end up with negative values for y here. So y is going to be less than or equal to 0. Now, if you have a hard time kind of understanding, you know, like why that's the case, just try to think of plugging in a couple of numbers. So like if you plug in x equals 1, for example h of 1 is going to be negative square root of 1 plus 3. And that's the negative square root of 4, which is negative 2. So your final y value ends up being negative. And there's no way for your final y value to ever end up being positive because you have this negative in front of the radical.
Okay, that's going to be important here in just a minute. Let's talk about how you find the inverse, which in this case is h inverse of x. So the first step is we're going to let h of x be replaced with the variable y. Second step is we're going to solve for x. So to solve for x, there's a couple of different things that I could do here. Uh, one thing that I can do is I could multiply both sides by negative 1. This will give us negative y is equal to the square root of x plus 3. And then now if, if I want to solve for x, I need to get rid of this radical here. So to do that, I'm going to square both sides. Now when you square both sides, something interesting happens. Negative y quantity squared is the same as y squared because the negative goes away when you square it. And on the other side, you just have x plus 3. And then when we subtract 3 from both sides, we end up getting y squared minus 3 is equal to x, or x is equal to y squared minus 3. And now our final step is that we're going to interchange x and y. So we're going to switch these. So the x becomes a y and the y becomes an x. And this is our inverse function. However, this can't be the inverse function because this function here is not one-to-one. -one. It's a parabola. And when you're talking about an inverse function, your original function must be one-to-one -one and your inverse function must be one-to-one. -one. But now you see we're getting back to the domain and range of the original function. So for h of x, the domain was that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 3. And the range was that y has to be less than or equal to 0. When you find your inverse function, the domain and the range get switched. And that's because x becomes y and y becomes x. So the domain for our inverse function would have to be x is less than or equal to 0. And the range for our inverse function would have to be y is greater than or equal to negative 3. So when I say my inverse function is h inverse of x equals x squared minus 3, I have to include the fact that x must be less than or equal to 0 for this to be our inverse function. And again, that's because if your original function had a restricted domain and a restricted range, your inverse function will also have to have a restricted domain, and it would also have a restricted range. And we'll talk more about this example in just a minute. Let's talk about the graphing interpretation of inverse functions. So we have the graph of f inverse is obtained by reflecting the graph of f in the line y equals x. So if your function is this blue graph here, and notice that we have a one-to-one -one function there, the inverse of that function when you graph it is going to be a reflection of this graph across the line y equals x. And this is the line y equals x. So in other words, this point here has a reflection across that line, which would be this point here. Right. This point here has a reflection across the line, which is this point here, and so on and so forth. Okay, And that's because when you're graphing an inverse, remember, an inverse function is just a reversal of the point x, y. So on the function f, you have the point x, y. Well, on the function f inverse, you have the point y, x. And that's because the y and the x are getting reversed. So let's take a look at a couple of basic examples. So earlier we talked about f of x equals 3x plus 4. And the inverse function was x minus 4 divided by 3. And what I want to do is graph both of those functions. And both of those are lines, so it's pretty easy to graph. And I want to show you that we have this graphical interpretation of an inverse function as being a reflection across that line. 
So here we have f of x, which is 3x plus 4. And here we have f inverse of x, which is x minus 4 divided by 3. And you can see that this is a mirror image. The inverse is a mirror image across this line. So for example, the point 0, 4 on the original function, the reflection of that is the point 4, 0 on the inverse function. And you can see that this happens with every single point on the curve. And this always happens with inverse functions. Now let's look at the last example that we did, that really interesting example with the square root. So what we had was h of x equals negative square root of x plus 3. And I went ahead and took the liberty to graph this. And you can find that by just plugging in some points. But I want you to see that the domain of this function is x is greater than or equal to negative 3. You can see that here, negative 3 is the lowest value of x, and it goes to the right from that point on. And also the range for this function is y is less than or equal to 0. In other words, only negative y values are covered by this graph. There is no graph up here. Now, when we found the inverse initially, we had said that h inverse of x is equal to x squared minus 3. Now, x squared minus 3 is a parabola. And so if you were to graph that parabola, x squared minus 3, what you would get is a parabola, a basic parabola that goes down 3 units. And so its graph would look something like this. And if you draw the line y equals x right down the middle here, so I didn't do a great job of graphing that down the middle, but you can, you can see that there is sort of a mirror image going on here, but there's too much involved in this graph. In other words, this can't be the inverse. Also, I want you to understand that this red graph here is not a one-to-one -one function. So there's something wrong here. And what is wrong is that we didn't take into account that the domain of the original function was restricted, and that gave us a range which was restricted. And as we mentioned earlier, the domain here becomes the same as whatever the range was in the previous function. So since the range is y is less than or equal to 0, the domain of the inverse has to be x is less than or equal to 0. And the range has to be whatever the domain was which in this case would be y is greater than or equal to negative 3. Well, the problem with our graph is that we did not restrict our values of x to only less than or equal to 0, which would have been this side. We have this other side as well, and we shouldn't have that. So let's go ahead and bring in the graph of the inverse function the way that it should look. So here is what it should look like. We have our original function, h equals negative radical x plus 3. And then we have our inverse function, which is x squared minus 3, which is this parabola, except that now I'm restricting it only to those values of x that are less than or equal to 0. So we're missing the right-hand side of the parabola. But I want you to notice that this looks correct, because now every point that we have over here has a mirror image across the line y equals x. So this point here has a reflection over here. This point has a reflection over here. This point has a reflection over here, etc. And so you can see that relationship that one graph is a mirror image of the other graph across that line. And this will happen every time you have inverse functions. And one final thing just to reconfirm here is notice that your original function, the square root function, is a one-to-one -one function because it satisfies both the vertical line test and also the horizontal line test. In other words, every single vertical and horizontal line that I can draw intersects that graph exactly one time. Likewise, every single horizontal and vertical line that I can draw to the other graph also intersects that graph only one time. So both your function and your inverse must be one-to-one -one when done correctly. Let's take a look at one final example. So here we have the function f of x equals x plus 5 over x minus 3, and I want to find the inverse function. 
So once again, first thing we're going to do is we're going to change f of x to be represented by y. And then we're going to solve for x. Now, when you solve for x, because you have a fraction, what we need to do is we need to multiply both sides by the denominator x minus 3. What happens on the right-hand side is these cancel out. And on the left-hand side, we're going to distribute. So we end up getting x times y minus 3y is equal to x plus 5. Now to solve for x, I'm going to get all of the x terms on the left-hand side of the equation and all of the non-x terms on the other side of the equation. So that means I'm going to switch these two terms. So that gives us xy minus x is equal to 3y plus 5. And then now that allows us to factor out x. And when we factor the x out, we can then solve for x by simply dividing both sides by y minus 1. So we end up getting x is equal to 3y plus 5 divided by y minus 1. Then, of course, we need to interchange x and y. So x becomes y and y becomes x. And this is our inverse function. Now let's graph these two functions together so we can see the symmetry that we should see from inverses. So you can see we have the function f here, which is the blue graph. Also down here, this is part of f. And then we have the inverse, which is this reddish colored graph. And you can see that we do have a mirror image. So this blue graph here has a mirror image on over the line y equals x, which is this graph here. And the red graph here has a mirror image across that line here. And the same thing is true down here. And so we can see visually that these are inverse functions. All right, now that concludes the section.